Did you program her to like me or not? I programmed her to be heterosexual, just like you were programmed to be heterosexual. Nobody programmed me to be straight. You decided to be straight? Please, of course you were programmed by nature or nurture or both. And to be honest, Caleb, you're starting to annoy me now because this is your insecurity talking. This is not your intellect. Ex Machina is what I consider to be the best kind of science fiction, the type that explores the human condition. In many ways, it's a cautionary tale like Frankenstein. We should be careful about playing God. In Ex Machina, Oscar Isaac plays an immoral scientist who does just that. Alicia Vikander plays his creation. I spoke with Oscar and Alicia and asked Oscar about the morality of his character and how it influenced his creation. The thing is, she also has access to all of the world's intelligence, you know? It's, again, it's as if Google could be embodied or one of these search engines that has access to all. So she has access to more than just my own uh, thoughts. And I guess just like with your own kids, you know, how, how much responsibility can you take over the actions of what your child does? A bit, you know, but where does the nature versus nurture happen and what is the nature of artificial consciousness? Um, so, so yeah, I think that I, I think that it's a tough argument, though, to say that sh anything that she does is particularly amoral. Um, I think it, you could describe it as selectively empathetic. Uh, you know, like all of us, we, we, we can empathize a lot with certain people, and with some people we can say, oh, no, no, they're not deserving of empathy because they've done this, 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 and that. Uh, I think it's the same thing with Ava. You know, she, she takes actions that are selectively empathetic for her survival. Now, for you, uh, two questions in one. How do you prepare for the role? Because your, your movements are very precise, yet human. Uh, and do you see her as a character that is devoid of morality, or it just doesn't occur to her? Um, how I prepared for the role, I, I wanted to, I don't know, of course. It was interesting. I thought of my maker sitting next, next to me, you know, kind of aiming to make something very precious, something very exquisite. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pure form. And I tried to make something, um, make it, you, still, you said she looked like, well, she moved like a girl. So that was my aim thing, to try and aim for that perfection of being a girl. And while I try to do that, while I try to move in a per perfectly human way or talk very, um, you know, in a certain quite calm voice that I tried to find. It, weirdly enough, turned out to be a bit robotic because it was too perfect, because, you know, um, uh, consistency is not very human. Mm -hmm. uh, flaws is more human. Um, and then when it comes to what of actions or thing, decisions she makes in this film, it all kind of comes down to whatever the viewer see herself or what, what you think that she has does she has conscious if she does you could partly see her as a woman being tra you know trapped in a room being locked up and doesn't have any other references really uh, to the world uh, apart from a maker until Caleb steps into that room and um, survival is a very human thing um, and then I think it's up to each person watching the film Okay. Do I have time for one more question? Okay. So, and this is a question if you have time to answer as well. What do you learn about yourself playing a role like this? Uh, well, I think, I think when I read the script, me as many people kind of had said watching the film is that they have they have quite a big fear it's for technology or the kind of movement of how fast things goes nowadays. And I think m maybe making the film, but also kind of sitting down with Alex, who mm. has have so many thoughts and ideas about this and has an uh, enormous calm <laughs> towards all of this too, which made me kind of, I don't know, see things in a quite new perspective. Um, yeah. Uh, I learned that I'm a fabulous disco dancer. Oh, yes, he is. Maybe we're talking about <laughs> it. I was so <laughs> jealous of that. Oh my if God. I have a choreographer for three weeks, then I'm a great disco dancer. <laughs> okay. That's what I've learned about myself. And Sonoya. <laughs> and Sonoya next to me so to, to take some of the attention away. No. <laughs> yeah. I hope you've continued. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see you dance again. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you both. Ex Machina is in theaters now, and we'll be right back. You and your friends are a 
part of it now. I don't have friends. I got family. Worldwide, it's made over two and a half billion dollars. We take a look back at the Fast and Furious franchise and what makes this on-screen family of actors so popular. Next, here on Arise On Screen. Who did this? Remember Owen Shaw? This is his big bad brother. He's a special forces assassin. They created a monster. Looks like the sins of London have followed us home. We're being hunted. It's been 15 years since the first Fast and Furious movie starring Vin Diesel and Paul Walker hit the ground running. In the wake of the passing of Paul Walker, the latest Fast and Furious 7 is breaking records with over $1.2 billion made worldwide. The series, having made $3.2 billion, has revved up to become one of the highest grossing franchises of all time. We caught up with the cast on the red carpet at the movie's premiere. It, it's awesome. This is so much fun. We come here, everybody's having a good time, and it's a celebration. And, you know, it's a celebration for the movie, celebration for the fans, celebration uh, in the life of Paul. So we're all celebrating. It is our great honor to, to live up to what the Fast and the Furious is all about. It's an all-inclusive, multi-ethnic, multi-religious experience because there's cars, adrenaline, beautiful women, and aggressive personalities around the culture of cars around the world. You know, it's interesting because uh, I had to rewatch a bunch of these movies and I really enjoyed Fast and the Furious 7. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they originally came out, I, I didn't really care. But I have to say, I kind of got caught up. I really, I get it now. I get why these movies have been so successful and why people love them. But I'm curious what you, what you guys think. Why do you think this one has made so much money? Do you think it's the death of Paul Walker, the curiosity? Yeah, I mean, just in general, I think that these movies are a reminder of why people go to the movies. You know, okay, it's an I event, it's a shared experience, it's it's hype, and then you, you want to go and be a part of something. Mm -hmm. You know, very few people actually go to the theater anymore, so I think that's one thing. And then also, there is a cast, right, that, that on screen is like this family that you're so True. compelled to watch. True. And as was just said in the clip, multicultural. So then you have this wider appeal and a global appeal. Well, not only well. multicultural, but 80% of the cast is non-white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for it to have made this kind of money, that in itself is mm -hmm. some sort of a milestone. I'm surprised that you weren't hooked from the get-go, because I was from, from the first one. And I have to say, I agree with Tyrese. I mean, you, you have muscle cars, muscled men, hot women, scenes that are mind-blowing, and action from literally the get-go to the end. It's like a nail-biter. You're at the edge of your seat, and, it, you know... I think well, that it's phenomenal what they've done with this franchise. I, I, I agree, and I think that's largely to Vin Diesel. Now, let me ask you about this. With the, with the death of Paul Walker, do you think that increased the interest in seeing yes. this film? Because I, I think people were curious to see Partially, how they were going to handle it. No, not for me. You see, I went into this one with a little bit of sadness because of, because of the death right. of Paul Walker. And I couldn't love this one, despite all the great action really? scenes. I couldn't love this one as much as I loved five and six because... Because, of, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, oh, it's such a shame. I can't believe that mm. Paul Walker mm. has left this family mm. after this one. And it doesn't mean the, the movie isn't great. It is. You do have a feeling of sadness but walking I, away. I felt it the entire yeah. time. I, I watched it with a heavy heart. And, mm. I, you know, and for me, sent this is it. Well. Yeah, yeah, after this, I can't, I can't bring myself to watch another one if there's an eight. Because I, I can't see another one without definitely Paul. Definitely going to be an eight. Now, now Justine, <laughs> did you have the heavy heart going in? Or were you curious how they were going to handle it? You no, know, I was curious. I was, you know, I have to admit, looking to see if you could mm -hmm. tell that it wasn't him at certain scenes. I know that his brother, Cody right. Walker, now has an agent and that's saying a lot but I think really I was able to enjoy it I think okay. I'm a fan of um, Vin Diesel and Michelle Rodriguez's characters
his relationship, Dom and Letty, and this film really explored that in a way that was so compelling to I me. I agree. Um, and I think the direction by James Wan, you know, the, the, the interesting places that he puts the camera. He brought you know, something new and fresh and to that it. I was, yeah, I was able to now, isolate that Now, let that me just status. ask a, on a last question here on the series mm -hmm. itself, because as people may or may not know, Fast and Furious 3, which I think is most people's least furious, mm -hmm. technically is supposed to take place between 6 and 7. Okay, yes. because the character dies. Do, what do you think? Why do you think this on-screen family is so? Why do you think it's endured seven films? That's a lot for anything. Because oh people want to see them together. People, well, I think just the drag racing, the street car racing, the the fascination of cars and mm -hmm. racing alone brings a big audience. And then you have this, you know, really beautiful family. Right. And the action scenes. I mean, they have escalated. Justin Lin, since he's been brought on, I mean. <laughs> It's unimaginable okay. what you what you've seen. Okay, now I got to ask you, Justine, because she feels so strongly. Do you think they should continue the series? Well, here's the thing: it made a boatload of money. Dairy Film Studio. Yeah. They need to make a profit. Do you think they should continue? <laughs> yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> No. I think they should finish. I think Seven they should. is it a good wrap nice, for me. It would have been a nice ending yeah. if they had ended it here, right. but I it, get that there will be more. And it did end nicely with that special yes. montage that you know mm -hmm. that they that they made. Well, don't give it away. Walker. Don't give it away. But yes, it does have great. <laughs> I'm ending. getting weepy. All right. Okay. Well, look, I've had so much fun with you guys. It went by so quick. Uh, I want to have you again, back again. All right. All right. And uh, <laughs> I thank you for being here. I'm Mike Sargent, and we'll be back next week to talk more movies here on Arise on Screen.